I'm Mark Nordenberg, and it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh's Institute of Politics and its Dick Thornburg Forum for Law and Public Policy to this series on Governing in Crisis. It is a particular pleasure to welcome you to today's very special program featuring the Honorable Jake Wheatley, uh, who has served with distinction in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives for nearly 20 years. Mr. Wheatley represents the 19th district, uh, which according to his website includes such historic Pittsburgh neighborhoods as the Hill District, Northside, Southside, Allentown, Hazelwood, Downtown, The Bluff, Knoxville, Arlington, Arlington Heights, and West, South, and North Oakland. Uh, if that listing of neighborhoods leaves those of you who are familiar with Pittsburgh geography, with the impression that this is a district that is characterized by irregular boundary lines. Uh, that would be an understatement. Representative Wheatley has told me that uh, it is known as the Amoeba District. Uh, and speaking more personally, I should say that uh, until the lines were redrawn following the 2010 census, uh, the house in which I live with my wife and the house in which I'm now sitting uh, would have been in Representative Wheatley's district, but that line is now a few blocks north of us. Representative Wheatley was born in Detroit, but spent some of his formative years in Minnesota, as I did. Uh, he is a Marine and a combat veteran of Operation Desert Storm. He also is an honors graduate of the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical University and earned a graduate degree in public administration from Pitt's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Among many, many positions of civic leadership, he now serves as a member of the University of Pittsburgh's Board of Trustees. Uh, when he joined the legislature in 2002, he became only the second House member in history to be appointed to its powerful uh, Appropriations Committee as a first-term legislature. Uh, and that became one of the bonds between us because as Pitt's chancellor, I made regular appearances hat in hand before Representative Wheatley uh, and that committee. Uh, Representative Wheatley and I also share a bond through the late great Speaker K. Leroy Irvis. Uh, Speaker Irvis was the first African American to serve as the Speaker of any American House of Representatives after Reconstruction. Uh, and he was a force in many areas, uh, including civil rights and higher education. Representative Wheatley calls his office the people's office uh, and quotes these words from Speaker Irvis on his website. Through us, they speak. Representative Wheatley, that seems to be a very appropriate place to begin our discussion uh, as we continue to move through this unsettling time, which has uh, hit us with the health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and more recently, an amazing local, national, and global response uh, to the tragic killing of George Floyd by a white police officer in Minneapolis. What do you think the people of your district would want you to say on their behalf uh, to those who are uh, viewing this discussion? Yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Mark, for having me. And uh, I really appreciate uh, 
uh, this opportunity to engage in a conversation around, because uh, we, we really are in a crisis at the moment, not just of um, the pandemic, but of the structural governance of this country, the direction of this country. And I think the people who I represent um, would, and they've said it to me uh, very clearly, they want change. They want institutional and structural and systematic change that allows for all citizen um, uh, to really maximize their quality of life and their life potential. And they don't want the, the barriers, the ongoing barriers that have been there that are preventing them from doing that. Um, we are experiencing right now the outcry and the demands for change around policing, but it's not just policing. Policing is part of um, the systemic problem, but the root causes of that, I, in my in mind's eye, is predicated on, uh, on class and race. And until we really get serious about doing something around uh, institutionalized racism, as well as the structure of poverty and what that does as it relates to um, um, continuously putting uh, citizens at a disadvantage from birth, um, I think uh, we will never get it right. And so my citizens are demanding that we, that we, meaning me as policymakers, actually do something about it and not just talk about it anymore. Well, you've put it not only just now, but in some of the things you have written uh, in a compelling way. Uh, here's one of the things you said. Uh, policing is just one part of a complicated maze of challenges that will dismantle systemic racism uh, and the various outcomes that result. In recent days, in particular, the term systemic racism has become something of a uh, hot button with high placed uh, leaders in the federal government denying its existence. What do you mean when you talk about systemic racism? Uh, I, I think I look at it from a standpoint of letting the data speak for it. Um, there, There is no better evidence of uh, a systematic um, disadvantage to a certain group of people than when we look at, um, for example, the life outcomes of um, African Americans in this region. Just recently, there was a report that talked about um, the, uh, this region and the life circumstances of African Americans, or particularly African American women. They could substantially improve their life um, chances, the, the, the length of their life, the, the quality of their life, just by leaving this region. Um, when we look at educational outcomes based on uh, irrespective of uh, income, uh, that an African-American child that comes from uh, a middle class or upper middle class family structure uh, has uh, less of a chance for academic success and achievement than a poor white individual. Uh, so when we look at statistics about uh, health or social um, or economic outcome, and you consistently see a group of people who, uh, who are similar in many ways the, as their neighbors of different hues, but their outcomes are different, then you have to ask yourself, what is it that is the underpinning reason for that difference? It's not, in my opinion, it's not biological. Um, I think it's more social and structural. And so when we start peeling back the onions and you look at the historic policy decisions that people make predicated on, um, on groups of people um, being uh, grouped in, uh, in instances based off of uh, their life outcomes, uh, I think that's when we start to say there are systemic uh, issues that's predicated on race. I mean, we, we come into this country's history knowing that race played a prominent role in how we view African Americans versus others. Um, and we've never really dealt with that. We, we've talked about it, but we never really dealt, to, uh, dealt with the institution of slavery and what that has done uh, and what has what's been per, uh, perpetuated over the years predicated on free labor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's why you have this, 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 this constant battle. It's kind of like this, um, this urgency to get away from our past without really dealing with our past. And I think if you were, uh, you know, if we had a psychologist in the room and they, we were sitting on a couch, they would want us to go and deal with the past because what we haven't dealt with in the past is gonna manifest itself continuously in our future. Well, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because if somebody says, uh, 
I don't believe there is systemic racism. Prove it. I mean, you've just shown you could prove it uh, yeah. because there is data. And so that could be either a short conversation if the person was willing to be persuaded or a pretty long conversation because the data is really compelling. Uh, whether you're looking, as you said, at health or at education or at economic uh, opportunity, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, you've got kind of a dual track challenge then. Uh, that is, uh, policing is just one part of a system of criminal justice that seems to have racial disparities at many points. And then quite apart from criminal justice, you've got education, you've got health care, you've got uh, home ownership, uh, economic opportunities. Uh, and I assume that what you're thinking now is that you've got to not lose focus on policing because it does seem as if there is a, an unusual opportunity for change. Yeah, but you also can't lose sight of the big picture. For sure. I think the immediacy of the policing issue is because we constantly keep seeing innocent citizens um, dying at the hands of those who are supposed to be sworn to protect them. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, that is an immediate uh, uh, situation that we need to address because that's what uh, the, 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 the civil disobedience in our streets are all about. But I think the greater um, context is, how do you do it in a way that you structurally change it so it doesn't have to keep uh, uh, rearing this ugly head? I think one part of it is holding um, all of our civil servants, police included, accountable to making sure all life is being protected. And when it's not, when you're not doing what you're supposed to do, we all have swift um, and transparent accountability that we have in that. But we also have to change the structure. Because I think culture and structure um, breeds the ability to do what we see happen to Mr. George Floyd and others um, by our law enforcement officers. And I want to say this. I don't believe all law enforcement officers are um, the problem. I believe they are products of a bad system. And until we correct that bad system, until we build a, a culture that allows for um, those um, very hardworking men and women in blue to continue to do their job and protect the safety and security of our um, communities, all of our communities, then we're gonna always have these bad actors who are gonna pop up here and there. And so I think that's why it's the immediacy of getting this system right. And I think that's why we have to talk about education. We have to talk about housing. We have to talk about the criminal justice system and reforms. We have to talk about the violence um, even within these communities because they are all part of the same, um, in my opinion, they're all part of the same structure of racism, the institutionalization, the demon, the demonation, the, the 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 belittling of life that happens to be black and brown, and I think that once we really get serious about addressing the core uh, issues around that, and we start putting in real policies and we start putting in real resources to address that, I think you will see less and less of these outside um, actors um, being the norm. You know, you said something just uh, then that uh, you have said consistently, and I think it needs to be underscored. Uh, that is, you have consistently said that your positions are not anti-police. Right. No, I, 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 it would be crazy for any of us um, uh, to believe that 100% of those men and women who go every day and put themselves in the line of um, fire to protect all of our lives, that they are all bad. You know, this is, this is not about them personally. This is about us, it really, truly for me, this is really about um, a system that allows for them to feel like they can't come forward, that they can't um, be who they need to be because they are penalized for doing it. For example, I, I use this all the time. Uh, when, <clears throat> When you have a culture that says that uh, your job uh, or your promotion status uh, is weighted heavily about how many um, negative arrests or arrests you make or uh, how aggressive you are in policing in certain communities, then it's hard for you to, to, to see your, 
your career advancing being the nice person, being the person that's going to look to be restorative instead of arresting, especially when you are um, put in communities where they deem them as dangerous communities and they, de and they teach you techniques to be aggressive in the dangerous um, communities or, or to view an individual that might be, who might look like me, who might be six feet two, to almost 300 pounds, bald head, and African-American as a dangerous image. You know, when, when, when you were getting hit with those images, and maybe you've never really lived amongst um, the people of color, or you, you come from an area where you only see news stories where you see the dangerous side of those communities, you come with a different aggression, right? That system is what we have currently. That's the current system. You, you're, you're, you're promoted, you're, you're supported, you're, 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 you're held accountable in how you police differently in certain communities versus other communities. And I think that is the, that is the thing that breeds a culture where you have these instances like we, we continuously see. I think that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to get at. We're, when we talk about our reform bills, we talk about decertifying and, and certifying training. We talk about um, providing opportunities for cities to um, don't have to go to arbitration when you clearly have a person who has um, um, stepped outside of their training, has violated um, people's rights and have been proven to have done something that they should not have. Uh, but you have to, uh, when you fire them or let them go and they go through arbitration, then you have to hire them back and you actually got to pay them their back pay from, from when you terminated them. All these things help seed a bad system to make it worse. You know what I'm saying? So it makes it harder for someone who, who's trying to do the right thing to see how I can advance in the right culture when all of the things around me are supporting the outside, what, we, what I'm calling the negative culture. Well, you know, and uh, one of the encouraging things uh, to emerge in the last few weeks are the examples of support that have come from uh, leaders within the police. Uh, and, you know, we've seen that in Pittsburgh with uh, Chief Schubert, uh, but we've also seen it on television as chiefs have kind of joined arm in arm with protesters and have said, uh, we're with you. On this. Right. Right. When you begin talking about uh, arbitration and certification and decertification, uh, that seems to be where you run into potential problems with the police unions. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, um, the collect I believe in collective bargaining. I believe that unions um, are important, but I think when we talk about public safety, I think um, there are certain areas within public safety that should be um, non-negotiables. Um, I don't believe that you, uh, any union, any uh, law-abiding citizen, any taxpayer would condone what we saw happen with George Floyd as a, a legitimate policing tactic. Right, I think we all universally think that that was terrible, that, that that was something that was beyond the pale, and that's something that should be punishable. But guess what? Had it not probably been caught on tape and had it not been uh, publicized in the way it was, uh, that person may have never uh, risen to the level of being fired or being charged because we've seen it over and over again, time and time again. And when they are um, um, uh, caught and they are prosecuted or fired from their jobs, it shouldn't be something that should be a part of their negotiated, arbitrated um, um, appeal process. It should be when, when you have something like uh, uh, this uh, civil uh, violation uh, of an infraction of this level, that should not be a part of the collecting bargaining. You shouldn't have to go to arbitration for that. A municipality should have the authority to uh, look at all the facts of that case and say that <clears throat> individual should not be any um, given the ability to police any longer. That so the 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 arbitration, the collective bargaining around public safety and allowing them to uh, collective bargain these types of instances, I think, is outside of what taxpayers really believe should be in there. And I think that's why we're trying to uh, to address it in some of our reform bills, but even further, I think our training, the, the fact that you have so many different police um, uh, yeah, levels, like you, the, the sheriffs are trained differently than 
uh, the municipal police and uh, the correction officers are trained differently than um, uh, the sheriffs. And we, sh we believe there should be a statewide process of certifying, training, licensing, and then there should be a statewide process um, shorter of uh, what we have currently. The only way you can decertify or take a license from a police officer or a law, law enforcement officer is when they are convicted of a felony. Well, we see very few of them ever get convicted of a felony, but there are certainly times when they act outside of their training that there should be like a stylist or a barber, a barber, when they do something, they lose points. And if they do something so severe, they have an opportunity to lose their license. We should, in every other profession in, in Pennsylvania, there's a process like that, except for law enforcement. And so we think those are types of uh, things that just make sense. The fact of the matter, have a database where when you you have a clear history of, of when someone is um, on the work and on the, on the job and they're doing things wrong on a job, keeping that in a, a statewide data, database so that police departments can see that clearly instead of depending on a department to share all of the information about a person, uh, a personnel decision that they've made. I think these are all common sense things that aren't revolutionary. They're not, you know, crazy ideas. There are things that the public, when they find out that we aren't doing it, say, why not? And, and some of them probably can be dealt with most effectively at the state legislative level. Uh, because I think this problem with arbitration, for example, is a widespread problem. And I've heard it described as the uh, municipalities didn't have money to give higher raises. And so they kept giving on these uh, other uh, kind of conditions of work and uh, arbitration issues. In terms of what you're really pushing for in Harrisburg, and, and maybe I should ask you more specifically about the uh, working group on police reform. What are the, the main things you're looking for? I know that this statewide registry is one of them. And I yes. assume arbitration change is another. Yes. Better training would be a third. Are there more <laughs> things than that? Yeah, they're, they're, so we've been working in the group, and I have to give um, uh, um, Representative Jordan Harris, um, uh, who's been kind of convening the group. Uh, there's um, uh, Mayor Perduto and uh, Mayor, um, uh, the mayor from Philadelphia. They've all joined um, and have participated and support the initiative. And I think primarily what, what we're trying to do, there is a, a element of the use of force. They would like to have some change to the use of force. There is this area around special prosecutor or independent prosecutor when you have these types of incidents that involves a police officer um, with using deadly force um, against a citizen. Uh, there's this element of, the, of course, tracking and training. And um, uh, of course, as we see the national level, there's the getting rid of certain um, choke holes and strangle holes and all, it's all the things that you kind of hear, um, you've been hearing for a while. Uh, many of the, the bills that we are talking about in our reform was put forth uh, over two years ago, almost two years ago. Um, and, uh, but now because of the time, the energy, I think um, you're seeing a different type of receptivity for these reforms. Uh, we have been talking with our uh, majority party uh, in Harrisburg in the House about some of the bills possibly coming up for um, conversation and debate in the Judiciary Committee. So we're hoping that uh, at least we'll get a framework together. But I think generally speaking, the, content, the concepts are around better training, uh, a state standard of training and certifying and decertifying. Uh, and in that um, training, a way to uh, eliminate certain um, lethal holes and lethal um, uses of force that um, that uh, we think we've seen over and over again that that doesn't uh, that aren't necessary and then this whole thing around a, a, a database that kind of uh, allows police departments the flexibility to to really know who they're hiring or potentially hiring um, those are some of the concepts and elements. Well, and you know, you said that uh, some of these bills uh, have been sitting and waiting for two years. Uh, and I, I think that probably uh, provides an important part of the explanation for why it is the Black Caucus 
uh, chose to uh, occupy the podium not too long ago. Uh, can you tell us why that particular tactic was employed within the House? So let me begin. I think we talked about this before, but I will say it um, for all of you to consume it because it, it was a very hard decision for me. Um, I come from, uh, as you talked about, I had a very strong relationship with Speaker Irvis. Um, one of my uh, mentors when I got to Harrisburg was a, a young man named Dwight Evans, who's now in Congress. Uh, and both of those gentlemen um, instilled in me a, res a great respect for the institution that we uh, work in in that capital. And uh, one of the things that uh, we, uh, we did uh, on Monday of this week uh, and taking that rostrum, uh, it really was <clears throat> the last straw because um, just, just the, the tradition, the historical significance of that chamber where we do the people's work um, should never be uh, abused or taken lightly. And that just shows how great of urgency we felt um, because all of the members on that rostrum that did that task have great respect for our institution. But because we could not get any movement, any, any real agreement to even have a discussion around these significant um, reforms and bills, uh, we felt the need to do that. And, when, and, and the rostrum, for those who may not know, is where the speaker um, kind of runs our chamber. It's, it's, it's the symbol of our, um, of our chambers and it's the, uh, the power center of our chamber. And um, 20 or so of the members, both black and white members from across the Commonwealth, um, decided that on this particular day, we weren't gonna do business as normal, that the speaker wasn't gonna be allowed to gavel in. Um, and gaveling in is really starting our day. It's, it's telling the, the, the world that we are, we are ready and open for business. Well, we weren't gonna let uh, the normal process happen. And so we took the rostrum uh, prevented the speaker from um, coming to gavel in and we wanted to speak directly to the people in our communities to let them know that we're going to we, we understand what they're asking for and demanding us to do and we're not going to just sit still and allow for bills uh, and these critical discussions to just languish in committee that we were willing to go to that drastic step and take over the rostrum and so I think that's how uh, important uh, this time is for all of us uh, to show that we are trying to do uh, some significant changes. Where, and there is a, a part of the legislative process that neither you nor I learned about in junior high school civics. Uh, and it's becoming more widely known because of what's happened in Washington, uh, where the Senate Majority Leader seems to take pleasure in being known as the Grim Reaper. Uh, because bills go to his office to die. Uh, and I think in a democracy, many of us never believed that a single person uh, could have the power to hold up consideration by the larger group uh, of something that they want to uh, debate and uh, vote on. Uh, and so when you think about it in those terms and you think about these bills having uh, been sitting for a couple of years, uh, there aren't too many options that remain if something is as critical as uh, this one. You know, if I can go back to something you were talking about before to, to deal with these issues on a uh, statewide or even a countywide basis can get to be complicated because there is such a wide variation amongst police departments. I mean, you think about Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh has a big department. Allegheny County, the University of Pittsburgh, some of the municipalities have good sized uh, departments. But then you have small municipalities that uh, you, you know, don't, and, and they employ part-time officers who uh, aren't very well paid. That itself is an impediment to training, isn't it? It is, but that's, and I think that's why it's critical for the state to step in and provide a level um, playing field for all departments. First of all, I, I don't know if uh, 
I, I don't know if it works for citizens for us to continue to do um, smaller departments that are voluntary or part-time. I think our time to really try to address um, a regional policing strategy might be here. Uh, but, you know, that's a whole nother discussion, an another um, the conversation around the regionalism and how we kind of share and cooperate amongst each other and uh, uh, for purposes of uh, better government, more efficient government. But, but even with that, if, if we're going to have this structure where every municipality and township borough kind of can do their own thing, have part-time, have voluntary, then we, the state should set the training level. The, tr the state should have provide the resources because I think it's critical for all of our law enforcement to be well trained, to be well staffed, and to understand um, all the mechanisms that are required to de-escalate and to provide safety, um, uh, a quality public safety for all of us. Right? That's the that's the basic level of what government should be doing for a citizen. Um, providing public safety is one of the basic um, things of government. And so when we talk about this uh, reform model, it's not just about policy changes, it's also about how we allocate resources to make sure those smaller municipalities and boroughs, um, when they can't provide the resources for um, their level of public safety, wh what's the responsibility that the citizens of the state has to make sure all of these departments have what they need from a training standpoint? Uh, and so, and so that's one of the things we we also are uh, are grappling with in our reform package. You know those types of things as well, because we do believe there are far too many uh, municipal, municipal uh, boroughs or townships whose police departments aren't equipped to really provide the level of training that's necessary for their officers to and, and the pay. Because we think you know if it, it, you know in a couple of instances um, the Antoine Rose situation that officer was working at two different um, locations. And, you know, there has to be a quality, there has to be some type of um, standard of, you know, uh, uh, of policing where you don't need your officers trying to double dip in that regards to try to pay their bills and uh, to live the type of life that they want. We should be able to provide a certain level of standard. Um, and so that's a part of the conversation as well. Yeah, or uh, a department that's so small it really can't release officers yeah, uh, to exactly. take a day to, to, to get trained. And, uh, and it does seem to go back again and uh, highlight something you were saying, that if you're going to have employees uh, who are carrying guns uh, and who are authorized to use force, uh, then they ought to be treated as professionals. Uh, and ought to have the kind of uh, assessment processes and training opportunities that, as you said, exist in other professions. Would you, would you be surprised to know that many of our uh, requirements for, I'm, I'm using that because uh, m my uh, fiance, she's a, a, a licensed cosmetologist. And the hours that she, is li she has to go through for her training, uh, it would be surprising to learn she has to go through more hours of training than some law enforcement um, personnel. And, you know, and I think the, the uh, cosmetologists are, are a significant part of our society, but clearly law enforcement uh, is a, a very important part of society. So their training, their, their requirements, their ongoing requirements should be um, uh, indicative of their responsibility. And I just why I'm saying, we, I think we need to really address and we readdress our training process uh, and MOPAC, uh, the Municipal Officer uh, Police Academy, they're, they're kind of like the oversight, overseeing board for municipal policing and training. Uh, this, this is nothing to take away from them. I just think that we need to reevaluate um, their role, their significance, um, and, and really look at what the state standards should be for policing in, in our Commonwealth. When we were talking yesterday, at exactly the time we were talking, I got a message from a group of Pitt undergraduates who are known as Nordenberg Leadership Scholars. Uh, they obviously had taken a lot of time to uh, prepare a, a draft commitment uh, that uh, they were going to take publicly, and they wanted to know not only what I thought of it, but whether I would join them. Uh, one part of the pledge that they want to make says that 
No one should have to beg for allies. Uh, and we pledge in this fight against racism to be allies without personal invitations. Uh, how do you feel about the way that people have stepped forward? Uh, you know, all colors, young and old, a kind of locking arms and saying, you know, this is America. We ought to do something about this. I'm very, I'm very proud. I'm very excited. I, um, as I said before, I think um, if you look through history, no significant movement of any substance has occurred just singularly by one individual group uh, or perspective. And normally it was young energy mixing with uh, mature wisdom. And it was always uh, 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 variations of who were part of that um, collaboration. When you look at the civil rights, it was always um, whites, blacks, browns, all of them coming together, um, moving together. And so this is very sim uh, sim uh, uh, similar to, to that in my mind, I, and I'm very excited to see um, that these uh, folk are hitting the streets because had not be for them doing what they're doing right now, we wouldn't be in this space um, in Harrisburg or in DC talking about uh, significant policing reform. Um, we wouldn't have this moment in time to really talk about a broader uh, systemic reforms to our society. So I'm very excited and I'm very thankful. And I, I, I say this every time I get a chance, it, it, I really, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing today. And, and, you know, again, if all you do is watch national TV, you've got to be very impressed because from city to city to city, every section of the city, uh, you see people turning out, but then uh, in our own region, it isn't just Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, it's suburban communities, it's exurban communities, and again, it's uh, people of all ages and races coming together, uh, though the young really do seem to be driving yeah. a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, I'm very impressed. I, I, I was reading something earlier today, and they were talking about um, some of the suburban areas where um, you don't have a lot of African Americans who might live there, but they were marching uh, in solidarity with the cause of uh, ending um, racism and ending this police brutality. And I think that's when that's really when you see significant change happening. Um, when you see the allies who aren't um, the the ones who are maybe being directly impacted, but I always say society in a whole is being impacted by this because it hurts all of us uh, when you have this type of despair treatment, this type of um, uh, institutionalized um, disparities. It hurts all of our society because we're not maximizing the potential of all of our citizens. You know, our conversation yesterday prompted me to think more about uh, Speaker Urbis, who really was a great man. Uh, and early this morning, it kind of struck me. Uh, I went down into the uh, living room and uh, went into my bookshelf and I pulled down his uh, first uh, volume of poetry. Uh, and I thought, I, I wonder if there's something in there that would be appropriate for me to read when Jake and I are together. And, and you'll have to decide whether I made a good choice or not. Uh, but here goes. This is a poem entitled Lions and Great Bronze Bars. Lions and great bronze bars speak not the same language. Lions are for roaming, great in their strength and freedom. But bars are meant to keep lions in and to keep out all whom lions would see and possibly love. So when bars ask, Lions, what may we do to assuage your pain? Lions weep, for lions know that bars and lions speak different languages. And, and you know, when I, I read those words, I, I thought about the current condition of society uh, and how it seems all too often uh, that we just talk past each other. Uh, not listening to each other and not really speaking or even wanting to speak the same language. Uh, but it does strike me that in the past few weeks, we have seen 
not everyone, uh, but a lot of people coming together to speak the same language in ways that will uh, hopefully propel the kind of changes you've dis been discussing. Uh, and so I do want to say uh, thank you very much, uh, not just for being here with us today, uh, but thanks for sharing uh, thoughts on one of the most important issues that is facing our country. Uh, and thanks for all the work you do every day to try to make uh, uh, District 19 and uh, our region and the Commonwealth uh, a better place. Uh, we really are grateful and uh, do wish you well. Thank you for giving me the space and um, thank you for having these types of conversations. I think they're very important. Well, and I suspect that given the agenda you outlined, uh, with health care and education and broader criminal justice issues, we'll have more to talk about over time, and I'll welcome that opportunity. Thank you, Thanks sir. Again.